Welcome back home brewers to part two of mine and Rob's little trip up to Sunderland to see the awesome folks here at Brew Lab. In part one, we learn all about the facility here, all about what Brew Lab do for the brewing industry. What are we doing with part two, Rob? We're delving into yeast. So we're going to be looking at propagating from a yeast slope. We're going to be looking at cell counts. We're going to be looking at yeast health in general. And we're going to be looking at some funky stuff in Petri dishes, right? I can't wait. No, neither can I. Let's go inside and see what we can find. So Alison, in this section of the video, we're going to be looking at contamination mm -hmm. of yeast. We've got various different plates here. Can you just talk us through exactly what exactly what we've got? Right. So these are a selection of agar plates where really it's a jelly that's impregnated with different nutrients yep. that allow certain organisms to grow. So the different colours, they've got the codons on the bottom. The first one we've got here is called WLN, Wallerstein Laboratory Nutrient, and that allows any brewing yeast, any wild type yeast, bacteria, aerobically to grow. Okay. okay, so you're looking at if you want to check hygiene, things like that, things that shouldn't have anything in. Yeah. So it might be a vessel that needs drainings taken from, it could be a utensil that you want to use, you could have swabbed it or something like that. Yeah. So that'll show up everything. Okay. Alongside that one, we have a yeast and mold plus copper plate. Yeah. So we add copper to it and that makes it so only copper tolerant things can grow on it, which tends to be wild type yeast, okay, especially so diastaticus. That one yeast. inhibits the growth of beer yeast. Yep. But what it will allow to grow is copper some nasty tolerant yeast. Yeah, yep. copper tolerant yeast. So what we would class as wild type yeast. Okay, so mm -hmm. theory is if anything grows on this plate at all, there's something wrong. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Then we've got another major type, which is lysine agar. Again, it's just a different nutrient and that inhibits brewing yeast to grow again and just allows non-saccharomyces wild type yeast to grow. So not all wild type yeasts would grow on that plate and that plate. Yeah. So we stick another one in there okay. to try and capture any wild type yeast that might be there. Yeah. Okay. We've got an anaerobic plate, which these are all incubated in air because yes. the organisms that will grow on these need air. This one are what we would class as your base spoilage organisms, your nasty ones, what you need in low levels to cause mayhem in the brewery. Yeah. They don't need air. Okay. okay, so they might be in very low numbers throughout the brewing process. And then as soon as your bee goes into conditioning tank or into bottle or cask or can, that's when they start growing like crazy. So you can taste the beer, just fine. Yeah. Taste it in the can six months later, six weeks later, sour. Got it. Okay, okay. or different flavour tints. So that gets incubated differently. We've got another green plate here, which is we had WLN at the beginning. We've now got WLD, which is exactly the same major as that, but we add a chemical to it and then it inhibits brewing yeast to grow. Right. So one plate would be looking for hygiene. Yeah. The other plate would be looking for any sample that's post pitch. Okay. So once you pitch yeast into it, yeast would just grow all over that plate. So there's a chemical to stop that happening so we can still see bacteria, Got wild it. type yeast on that. Okay. okay, so let's relate this back to the homebrew world. Yep. How would we test a sample of either ready-made beer or perhaps mm -hmm. if we want to reuse the yeast right. for the, from that batch? How would we go about testing? So first of all, you want a representative sample yes. of what you're testing. So it might be... Um, you need a sterile container, you can sterilise them yourself, yep. you know. Take a sample and we're basically going to spread a volume of this beer over the surfaces of this plate. Certain plates you might get counts on. So, you know, the WLN, if you were putting yeast on, you would get a count on, so we're not going to use that one. No. So depending on the sample, depends on the selection of media plates. Okay. Okay, so these four are selected for beer samples that's got yeast in yep. or yeast samples because right. it's going to inhibit brewing yeast to grow. Okay. Okay. So we basically normally would label them up as to what the sample is in the laboratory for if it's 
homebrew or yeah. whatever it might be one sample that you're checking okay so first of all we look at the the place to make sure there's nothing growing on them already because you might have got a mold spore or something like that in your fridge where you're storing them oh, okay. don't want to yeah. use that yeah, i've got an example of a mold I'll show you yeah, i'm looking at them all they perfectly poured as well so they're yep. all wrapped up or anything that's, yep so they're yeah. perfectly poured sometimes you get a little bit of condensation not too much but yeah. if that was really wet with condensation we would just it's okay away. okay so now we're going to turn them up the correct way and basically they're just jelly in the bottom of the agar plate okay, okay. we're then going to take our sample so this will presume could be a bottle of beer, could be a sample of anywhere through the broom process. We're going to upturn it because sometimes if it's laid about on the bench for a bit, yeah. everything will sink down. So we just want to make sure it's a representative sample. In the lab here, we always have a burner on. Okay. okay? And what the burner is for is for sterilising some of the things we're going to use, but also when you've got some heat source, heat rises yeah, and then falls. Yep. So you've got an umbrella of cleanliness beneath that heat so you're not going to get anything dropping into your samples while you're analyzing them yeah. okay so that's on in the lab here we use what's called sterile tips and a gilson so these are quite expensive but i will show you a, a cheaper way to to do it or you know yeah. what you can do hands-on so what i'm going to do i'll show you how we do it and then i'll just do it on two plates yeah. and then i'll save them two to show you a different way what Perfect. wouldn't involve all this equipment Perfect. okay so just putting the tip end on there. These tips are all sterilised. Yeah. And then we're going to take the lid. If you notice, holding the lid in my little finger, it's yeah. not touching anything, not touching the bench or anything like that. So it's not going to pick up any contamination. I'm going to just press the dropper down. Get the sample there. Put that underneath that umbrella. Yeah. And then we're just going to press that then. Get rid of that. And then we can put lid back right. on there okay. okay we've got a little tub of acetone you could use methyl spirit anything anything that will flame okay got a glass spreader these are just glass rods that we bend in the burner yes so you can make them yourself if you wanted to just going to set fire to that and it's been sat in the acetone so it'll be sterile anyway yeah, but we're just, just flaming it off. just to yeah. burn off now we're going to lift the lid off we're not going to put it directly in the sample because this might be a bit warm yeah. and it might sterilize the sample so we're going to just touch the agar to the side to cool it yeah and then we're just gonna just spread it around do that put the lid on Bosh. job done right so sample number two take another take a sample inject expel one thing we have to um, look for, I'm going to burn that again. One thing we have to look for is once we put the tip on the end of the Gilson, that we have to keep an eye on it so we're not talking to somebody and touch something with it oh, and, course, yeah. and contaminate the tip. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. Job done. So, Alison, that's how you do it here in the lab. Mm -hmm. As we said, people might not have, people probably won't have this equipment at home. Mm -hmm. How can we, how can we go about replicating the process as best we can at home? Right, so... You don't need a burner. These are just camping burners, so you know people yeah. may have them. Yeah. You could work in your kitchen near your stove. So if you've got a gas stove, get that heat. Yeah. You know, same sort of thing. So you've got your heat source to give you that protection. Sure. Now, what you can buy in these are sterile loops, yes. and you can use these a lot in home brewing for replicating yeast slopes and things like that. Yeah. Again, they're measured. So when we were using the Gilson and the tips, that was 0.1 mil. These are 10 microliters, so that's 0.01 oh, okay. mil. Yep. Okay, so a smaller volume, um, and it's just a loop. If you fill that loop, you've got, got so the, the volume. So the extension of the, of the product sits in the loop. Yeah. Got it, I understand. So basically, we're gonna do the same thing as we did before. And there's two ways we can, we can do it. We can either open that, Dip it in. You can see that yeah, the yeah, loop's full. Yeah. We'll just loosely put that on. Get your major plate. If you just tilt it to the side, and you just right, wiggle just that loop on. and try and cover as much as that surface as you can. Okay. okay. Well, that sounds, so you don't need to enough. spread it yeah. or anything like that. The other way is get loop.
dip your loop on there and then you can buy disposable spreaders so we sometimes use these with our students when we if they're doing this sort of analysis downstairs in the brewery yeah so there's no flame quick sometimes you get malt dust and things that's quite flammable so um just use that do the same thing and then then realistically just using the loops does yeah, the job because it spreads yeah, it all that, over. That, that seems really simple. And that's the same. The only difference is when these are incubated and the chems come off, we would normally count per mil. So we'd multiply that result by 10. Yes. Multiply them results by 100. By 100. Because okay. you put less volume on. Sure. And that's it. So Alison, we streak the plates. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Right. So we have to incubate the plates because yes. every area on the surface of that plate where there's been one contaminant yes. one organism we'll put it somewhere warm for a certain amount of time and that one organism will grow up into a colony yep. what we can visibly see okay okay so, so these would be colonies right these circles on here so you can then physically count what's yep. going on so okay. the aerobic ones and um, these normally get incubated at brew lab 27 degrees for the green ones yep. for three days the lysine ones are 30 degrees for two days at home home brew wise um, 27 degrees or approximate yeah and some home brewers use you can get a little propagation yeah, you know what you'll put feeds in yeah, and yeah. things like that yeah. just somewhere warm yeah so they would be in the air we upturn them so any condensation that's formed during the incubation period so drops on the lid yeah and then you can see what's going on if there's any mold grows on them you can always look through the back of the plate because okay. you can still sort of see through the, the back what the colonies are so Alison we've got our plates here mm -hmm. after three to five days mm -hmm. what are we expecting to see so these are the original plates yes. so really this is what we want to see so three to nothing, five days later yeah, nothing, nothing there at all. nothing whatsoever because if anything is growing it means we've got contaminants yeah we move on and this is what's going right so okay each one of these replicates each one of these yeah got it so what do we think that we've got here so we we've got here? <laughs> this agar plate we were inhibiting brewing yeast to grow yes. so anything that's grown on there is either bacteria or wild type yeast yeah so we can see that we've got that in here we've got yeast on there and um, you can confirm as yeast by taking a little pick of one of the colonies and look down the microscope we'll do that in a minute yep this lysine plate, you can see the white colonies on there. Yes. Same thing, non-saccharomyces, wild type yeast. Okay. So this beer sample has got one wild type yeast, confirmed that it could potentially be non-saccharomyces, yeah. wild type yeast. It could be the same yeast, you know, just growing differently on the different majors we've given it. Got it. This copper plate, that is loaded but as you can see there's two different types of contaminant on there yeah, so you've got very small sort of beige look, looking ones and then you've got larger cream white looking ones yeah. so that indicates there's two different types of yeast wild type right. growing on the copper plate okay. so this has got so many wild yeah, type yeast in there there's something not right yeah we've also got growth on the raccare plate the anaerobic plate so that probably is an indication it's got lactic bacteria as well okay. so it's not a very good result no, of the play real funky beer this one so this could be um cause sourness yeah it could over ferment you know strip all the sugars out sure so you could have a really astringent beer it could be fobbing all over the place if yeah. it was in small pack it Carry could be exploding yeah. bottles yeah, right. peaked cans you okay. name it so it the, could cause anything so the takeaway from this is after three to five days we want to see absolutely nothing growing that equals clean. Yep. If we see anything growing, we got contaminants mm -hmm. and we got an issue. One thing to remember: how did the take the sample? That's always the priority. Yeah. Was it a representative sample of the beer in the vessel they took it from? Got it. If it was a dirty tap, yeah, because you could the, get the same sort yeah. of thing. So you've got to be very careful how you take the sample. So, Alison, let's take a look at actually looking at yeast underneath a microscope. Mm -hmm. How would we prepare a slide to do that? like to do that so if we were checking the hygiene on the yeast we would do it exactly the same way as this yes. but there's additional things you need to do with yeast so one thing is viability yes which is out of all the cells that's in there percentage wise how many are alive and how many dead sure. because 
it might be healthy and well not healthy it might be contamination free yes but it might be half dead okay and it's still going to cause issues in the brew and you know fermentation and things yeah. like that so that's one thing we're going to um, prepare first so we use flat slides now yeast can be a bit thick sure um, and if you were to put a, a yeast sample out of a yeast bucket or something that you'd retain from a you know brew in a bottle or something like that if you put a thick um, drop of it on a microscope side all the yeast would be just tightly packed together right, and you wouldn't so really see anything say, yeah. so because it's a viability it's a basic percentage so it doesn't matter if we dilute the sample down right okay? okay so i'm going to put this is just sterile water you could use boiled water yep. in the kettle as long as it's been cooled and just going to put a loop full onto the microscope slide so this is going to be really helpful for someone that's had yeast stored in their fridge for example or their growing yeast from the dregs of a bottle mm -hmm. um, or any yeast that's been stored or a starter for example so that they can actually check out the viability of yeah. their yeast mm -hmm. and ideally you want a viability of more than about 95 percent yes so you'll notice i haven't got a burner on we're just checking the height yeah like, we don't need, we don't don't need, need a burner on no so i'm not taking a full loop i don't know if you can see i'm just actually touching so there's a titchy bit got it on there because even if you took a full loop of it, what you can see is I mix it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's that milky, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's our yeast solution. Got it. What this is also good for is, um, you know, people recommend you shouldn't keep your, your slurry for more than a week. Yeah. Sometimes you can keep it for a couple of weeks. And if you check the viability, you know, it might still be really for alive sure. and yeah, you, yeah. you might be throwing it away when you don't yeah. really need to. Um can be used for lots of techniques if you get a stuck fermentation i don't know why it's you know what's happened to the yeast all the yeast might have died off yep. so you could actually get a sample of beer and do the same technique to check of the yeast that's in it, that beer is it, still alive? is it alive is it not yeah okay. got it so. so what's the that's methyl blue that you've just so this there? is methylene blue and um, what happens you mix it with methylene blue methylene blue will go into all the cells yes those that are alive will metabolize it and expel it so okay. All of them go blue yeah then the ones that were alive go white again i understand so if they remain blue they're dead they're dead okay, okay. so so we're going to put a little cover slip on must always use a, a cover slip and this really protects the microscope that we're going to use it yeah. flattens the sample out as well so you've got a good view of the sample I understand. but stops any of the sample getting on your Jumping object lens. lenses yeah yeah okay and we normally put the microscope slide on at an angle like that so it's sort Perfect. of falling like that yeah. and it squeezes all the air bubbles out. Nice. If you just drop it on the top, you get loads of air bubbles trapped underneath. Yeah, got okay. it. Sometimes an air bubble's a good thing yeah. when you're focusing on the microscope. I understand. Okay? okay, so this is ready to view on the microscope and we're hoping it's going to be 95 plus alive. Right, so this is basically a light microscope. It's got times 10 magnification on the eyepiece yeah. and then it's got different objective lenses, times 10, times 40 and times 100 we only need the times 40 okay. to be able to see yeast cells so you've got times 10 up here times 40 so that's going to magnify the image by times 400 okay. and we'll be able to see yeast cells right so okay. we don't need it's a relatively basic microscope that we're looking at we're not looking at some fancy piece of equipment that is no. thousands of thousands of pounds no. No. Okay. if you use the times 100 on here which would magnify by times a thousand you start to have to put oil on your sample and things like that so it yeah, just makes yeah, things just not needed you don't need it yeah. no you don't need it okay. um, any microscope what you buy you know would do that um, you need to have a clip and that's really just to hold your slide in place and you need what's called a mechanical stage and it's just so you've got, yeah, got control it. of moving that about because you can get some microscopes where you have to move with your fingers and oh, a tiny really movement tricky. that way yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. out the way Okay, one thing we have to remember when we turn the microscope light source on is that we're not looking down it because if it's on the mass maximum power you can damage your eyes yeah. when you're looking down so we're just going to turn the the light coming up down and then you have to adjust the eyepiece when you're looking down the eyepiece oh, yep, just okay. like that so when you're looking down whoever's used it before you um you might see overlapping circles so you just want to adjust it to fit, fix your eyes perfectly so you see in one circle and sure. that's classed as a field of view okay? okay 
so I'm just going to increase the light through here just that and then this is what we class as a coarse magnification and then a fine magnification so okay. I'm just gonna have a little so this is giving us our focus yeah focusing in and then when I can see hints of blurry images I'm then going to use the fine focus to see that's it unfortunately all that yeast is dead <laughs> <laughs> looking down there so yeah, so it's it's not a hundred percent dead, but it's probably is about ninety percent non viable. So we would definitely not be using that no. for brewing. And have looked at. Yeah. You might have to adjust that eye pace, but you'll see everything's blue. So we can see that this yeast is pretty much we're thinking about ninety five percent dead. Okay, with a slide like this, mm -hmm. when we're doing a viability check, how do we go about doing that? So how to calculate the viability. Indeed. So basically we, we've diluted the sample. It doesn't make a difference because we're looking for a basic percentage yes. alive dead. So it doesn't matter how much we dilute the yeast down, but that does make a massive difference when you're doing yeast count. So never do a yeast count and a viability at the same time. No, they're two separate, separate. two se separate processes. Yes. So let's just, separate. just for this second, let's just look at viability. So viability, you count basically 100 cells. Just a random 100 cells. 100 cells. And of those 100 cells, how many are blue? Yep. They're the so dead ones. So they're the dead ones. So the white ones are your percentage viability. So if there's five blue ones, 95 white ones, it's 95% viable. that's what we want. Ours is the opposite way around. Yeah. 95 dead ones, a couple of white ones there so it's it's not a very healthy yeast so um we did viabilities on a flat slide yep. there's another type of slide we use for dealing with beer and yeast and it's called a hemocytometer so okay. basically it's a counting chamber yeah so, we, so this is where we're looking at cell count yeah yep. so this is basically a flat slide um, and you get quite a few you get about 50 in a box and they're you know quite reasonably priced about um a couple of pound yeah very thin just a sheet of glass, what you would put your sample on and cover with a cover slip. Got it. Okay, put that there. Now we're here beside Tom, there is a bit more technical. It's quite thick, as you can see. These cost about £75 each, so they're quite expensive. Yeah. And basically what they are, they've got two areas there. You've got these little lines there. They're a trough, and if you hold it to the light, you'll see little etchings in the middle of each of them squares. Yeah. And that is actually a grid, yep. what we can count on. So we know how big each square is on there. When you, once you apply your cover slip, we actually apply the cover slips dry. So we we'll breathe on the slide, and then we slide the cover slip on, and it sticks. Oh, okay, got it. So the two sides of this are slightly higher than where the grid is underneath. Yep. So when we apply the cover slip, it gives a fixed volume underneath there, so we know the size of the grid, yes. the depth of what's underneath there. So if we introduce a yeast sample, count how many cells is in that square, do a little calculation, we can calculate how many yeast cells are in per mil. Okay. If you to use a flat slide, there'd be so many different planes of cells. Yes, they might be on top of each yeah. other. Yeah, it's not, we wouldn't. So yeah. you wouldn't get it. Okay. So basically how we do this, so we've fixed that slide and cover slip together. So you would just take a sample that could be a beer that's in fermenter, you've just pitched it, you want to ensure that there's enough yeast cells in there. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's left it a few hours. Um, let me just take a sample. And we're just going to touch the edge of the cover slip. And can oh, you see yeah, capillary perfect. action instant, just drags instant. that yep. and covers that um, grid. And then we take it over to the microscope. Alison, this is really interesting because mm -hmm. we're not testing a slurry of yeast here we're testing a pitched yeast mm -hmm. into a volume of beer right at the start of fermentation yeah. yeah and i think this is where a, a lot of complication comes in and misunderstanding comes in mm -hmm. if you were to use a slurry of yeast and do a yeast count on a slurry of yeast it would be so compact yeah you wouldn't be able to count it and every cell you miscount on a hemocytometer equates to 10,000 cells per mil. Yeah, so we're way out. Yeah. yeah if you diluted and diluted. And we used to um, dilute, I think it was something like four mils of slurry to 96 mils of water for some reason. Okay. <laughs> and that would 
sort of dilute it down, but you don't know how thick your yeast slurry is going to be. That was quite a, a loose slurry where you get some of that, you know, the like little cakes, aren't there? So you're always better off to under pitch, check your yeast count in your pitch samples, and you can always add to it rather than you can't take it away if you put too much in. Alison, this brings us on to a really interesting conversation about pitching rates. Mm -hmm. And we know that many problems are caused in the homebrew world because of under pitching mm -hmm. of yeast. So we can give under pitching of yeast can give various issues right throughout the fermentation um, and introduce some off flavors through stressing the yeast, for example. Mm -hmm. How big a problem is over pitching and how far do you have to over pitch before you get well, what happens? What, what? Well, if you, if you pitch too much in, you know, you can get very fast fermentation. You can get different flavours produced. Again, you can the yeast can stress yeah. because they're not under natural conditions. What you, and, you, and you might not get reproducibility of that beer. You want a, a controlled fermentation and you want to be able to get that yeast out at the end as well. So, you know, for it to drop out, you might get issues. You might get a lot left in suspension that you can't drop out. Alison, just one of the things that brought us here to Brew Labs was your yeast slopes and people propagating up your yeast slopes at home. Mm -hmm. um, the yeast count from the slopes, how do we ensure that we are pitching the correct amount of yeast for our brew? Right, so it depends how many cells you can agitate off the surface of the slope. Yep. But we've done tests that if you're you know, if you rinse the majority, so visually it looks like most of the cells have gone in. And it's important when you do your step up, so you, you want to just start your initial um, propagation, maybe 20 mil if you can. It's okay to put it straight into where 250, 300 mil, but better off doing small little increments because every time you step up, you get more cells produced. Yeah. You know, so... Um, the important thing is, is when you've got your final propagation ready to pitch, you want to give it a good swirl, that's when you do your yeast count and your viability check. And then you can measure, depending on how many millions of cells there are per mil in your prop, you'll know if there's enough to go into wherever in volume you're going volume. to pitch into. It might be a case of there isn't enough and you might have to do another step up to ensure, or you might be brewing a higher gravity beer where you need a few more yeast cells in there to cope with the alcohol and the gravity is going to ferment down. Just while we were talking about volumes, mm -hmm. when we're making a starter mm -hmm. or when we're stepping up, did you say that there was a rule of thumb for the amount that you step up for each step? At Brew Lab, we normally start at about a 20 mil. Yep. So, but we're not going from a full slope. We're just taking a few cells off a slope or from a cryogenic bead yep. and then stepping them into maybe 10, 20 mil. With a slope, there's a lot more yeast cells on sure. the full surface. So I would say probably 100, 150. Yeah. Or if you're just going to pitch into a 20 litre or a 25 litre, maybe score 300, 500 if it doesn't look like there's enough cells. And then some people may go up to the litre, but I think that's a bit excessive. They should have. We've done some trials, so rinsing off the slope, straight into a 300 mil work prop should give you sufficient cells for a 25 litre brew. Okay, yeah. and then when and that would be pitching 10, mil, 10 million mils per mil. Yeah, okay. okay. So, as a rule of thumb for stepping up, mm -hmm. would it? It's not possible. You wouldn't want to go just for example from 200, 200 mil to two liters. There's a there's a kind of rule of thumb ratio that you go through. Yeah, don't go more than your original, more than two times your original volume. Right. So it's gradual step ups. Normally, when you get to about a two litre stage, there's enough. If, if it was a, a barrel of beer, you were going to brew like 100 litres or something like that. Yeah. We would normally, once we get to two litre stage, that is enough to do a 15 litre propagation, not a brew, a right. propagation. Yeah. So, and then from 15 litre, we just um, say 15 litres sufficient for a barrel, and it would be multiples of that. So we do propagations for five barrel. 120 litres larger brews you know so yeah. half half and half it's it's good to take it slow and easy but in between those step ups you've got to give that yeast good time to grow so you want you know 24 to 48 hours in between so yeah. you know do a did advance of when your brewers don't just pitch it the day before into you know your propagation and then hope that it's going to have enough cells for the brew. Alison at this stage we're looking at yeast slopes and how to 
perhaps split a yeast slope or inoculate a new yeast slope with either a slurry or perhaps a wild yeast that you found. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the techniques exactly the same. So this is this bit here. You can see there's isolated colonies. Yes. And um, we can't see any bacteria around. So basically. So these are what we call blank slopes. Mm -hmm. And all the all we do here is we put a little bit of maltego yep. in, and then a lead as you can see here, yeah, a lead them to dry or an angle, dry on an yeah, angle, and that gives you surface. a big surface area. Yeah. So basically, we're working under the flame again. Take the lid off. Give it a little flame. See if it's our loop, and we're just going to pick a little bit. Yeah, literally just a tiny amount off. And start at the bottom. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And you're literally just spreading that across the surface of the agar. A bit like what we did on the plate with the yep. lid. Done. And then we just don't tighten it right up, just hand tight and allow it to incubate for a couple of days like that. In two days, well, not without the, the line up, but that'll look like that. Got it. Covered in yeast. And then we just start, then you can tighten it. Yes. Put it in the fridge. And, what's and that the lasts sort of... about six months. Ah, that's my question. Yeah, yeah so I'd say six months on, on that. Mm -hmm. right. Important thing is, if you're doing this with a lot of different yeast types, label up the back of the slope there and the lid, just in case you put the lid down. Oh, you yes. put the lid down and I you can can't imagine. remember which yeah. lid went yeah, which one. Yeah, a couple of them hanging just around. Just so you've got a bit of pen mark and indication what it is. Yeah. So that's that. The yeast slope, it's a little bit more fiddly because you've got two lids. Yeah. So... So this is where we're taking a yeast slope and we're going to take some cells from one yeast slope and put mm -hmm. it onto a blank yeast slope so we're replicating. Yep. So same thing. We're just going to take a few more. Take them out. Fresh yeast slope, uh, malt slope. We're just going to shake just in case there's any moisture. And then again, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And it's good to do this before you brew, because then you can use that one to brew with. So if this was then now going to be used for a brew, we would take the lid off and you can put your extract in. Yes. And then put the lid on and shake. Or to get more cells off, if you've got loops like this in place, you would just put your extract in and then before you put the lid back on, just go on and scrape yeah, the whole scrape surface off, and agitate them yeast cells off yeah. then give it a shake okay so that's the only difference and then that would be ready to flame and pitch in the word got it okay the other one is your yeast slurry so if you were to be brewing a beer and you want to retain some of that yeast it could be either from the skim or you could take a sample midway maybe at the end of fermentation then just put it in the refrigerator allow the yeast to settle down there's quite a bit in there so it becomes a little plug in yep. the bottom of your container. Tip off the excess solution. So you're left with a little plug of yeast. And then same thing, just in there, loop in. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Perfect. Done. Alison, I want to say a huge thanks for giving us access to your facility here. <laughs> the Brew Lab whole setup is absolutely fantastic and a real resource mm. for the brewing and home brewing world. So thank you very much for that. It's been really great. Welcome. Come back anytime. No worries. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem.